I am Stacy Iwanicki, president of McHenry County Audubon, and it is with great privilege that we are hosting this program for all of you tonight. Uh, thanks for making time to join us. McHenry County is in the far northern uh, is in far northern Illinois, along the Wisconsin border, halfway between Rockford and Lake Michigan. MCA is the oldest environmental organization in our county and has been advocating for birds and their environments since 1961. We believe that birds can nurture a greater environmental awareness and appreciation and bring people together across many boundaries. Uh, we are also excited to be hosting the IAS Spring Gathering in May and are looking forward to meeting many of you uh, in person then. But now I'd like to introduce to you my friend, a wonderful birder and explorer, and most recently, the president of Illinois Audubon Society Board of Directors, Randy Sheetzel, to introduce his good friend and our speaker for tonight, Randy. Okay, should be unmuted, hopefully. Yes, everyone can hear me? Yes, you are good, Randy. <laughs> All right. Um, I've been fortunate to know Gustavo for over a decade now. Uh, started as a class from Harper College. Uh, when that opportunity went away, it came time for ex-students who wanted to come back. Lately, it's been friends wanting to go down. And this past April, I got to do one of his bird tours. Uh, part of the reason I keep going back to Costa Rica, and occasionally I get questions, why do you keep going back to the same spot and wouldn't you want to go somewhere else? Well, I really learn a lot from Gustavo and his wildlife preserve, where I've mainly spent time, is really rich in diversity. Part of the reason most of you want to be here tonight is the amount of diversity that's in the tropics. Uh, just had a trail cam photo from when I was there last August of a jaguar walking on the trails where we walk. I got my lifer woolly opossum last year, my lifer ornate hawk eagle. Keep finding new stuff all the time. So all that diversity means a lot of species are in pretty low numbers. And when you keep going back, you find stuff. And Gustavo is a good person to find that with. Uh, you'll notice he has really good English. He spent a year at the University of Kansas. He's also been a bird guide for all the big companies, pretty much all of them, uh, since the beginning. Uh, he started in college. I mean, he spoke English and he's taken ornithology courses. And one day the professor came in and said, who knows how to speak English? And before there were really uh, bird tour companies, uh, a group of American birders went down there and were asking, hey, how can we find someone to show us the birds? And they went to University of Costa Rica, went to the ornithology class and asked who can speak English. And Gustavo with his year of English in University of Kansas raised his hand and kind of been off and running ever since then. Um, he also has his own private nature preserve that has been open for a field station in the past, but uh, was designed originally as a protection for the bare-throated umbrella bird, which I assume there may be a picture tonight, species of conservation concern. And we see it every year there. And I guess I'm gonna do a little bit of an ad for Gustavo's company. Uh, you do hear one of the ideals if you go on a birding tour is you want the money to go to locals, and that certainly happens here. There's less layers of international companies adding on fees, end up being a good deal. Uh, also, tends to focus on having local preserves. Last April when I was there, the first place we went was a private nature preserve where a family bought a farm, and they're developing it restoring it back into uh, rainforest. And one of the things that was rather impressive is we went to this private nature preserve up the road and it's just like Monte Verde, except we were the only people there. Mm -hmm. So instead of having these highly structured trails because you have way too many people walking on them and people all over the place, it was just us there with the quesals. Um, Last year, I started out with 520 species. I'm up to 580 after his tour. It's pretty good adding 60 species at that point. And I guess with that, I'd like to welcome my friend Gustavo and let him tell us about birds in Costa Rica. 
Well, thank you, Randy. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. Um, well, just to add a little bit uh, of what Randy just kindly said about me, I've been birding since childhood, and um, my, my great uh, inspiration was my grandfather, who was very kind to build a small bird feeder for me when I was a kid. And um, it was in the back of our house. And I remember I still have very vivid memories of that, uh, seeing Orioles and seeing a mix of uh, many tanagers that will visit our feeders and so. And then Orioles would come for a little while and then they would disappear. And then I never understood why that happened. And I said to my grandfather, hey, grandpa, why are the orange birds leaving the fruit feeder? I mean, we always feed them. Our, they, they probably don't like us anymore. And with time, I understood that these birds were migrating. And my whole fascination about birds started there. As Randy said, as I've been, leaving, I've been uh, leading tours for many of the reputable companies out there for a number of years. And about uh, 12 years ago, I established my, uh, my tour company. And I was combining my tour company with my biological field station that Randy um, spoke about just a little while ago. Um, tonight's presentation is about uh, bird diversity in Costa Rica, and I want to showcase a little bit about uh, the rich uh, biological diversity and bird diversity in Costa Rica. And I want I wanted to take you through uh, a wonderful trip, um, starting with the geological past of this area of Central America until the present day, and what we're doing about to conserve. Uh, this wonderful and, un and unique species of Southern Central America. So without further ado, I, uh, I'm going to briefly disappear from the screen to uh, share this presentation with you. There we go. Okay. Um, I just want, I, I just need someone to uh, confirm that you're seeing uh, the screen and, yes, and that you're seeing the presentation on the screen. Yes, Gustav. Yes, a parrot or something. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to try to disappear from the whole screen because I actually I'm going to need the whole screen at some point during the present, during the present. Uh, All right, so uh, we're looking at um, a green one of the iconic uh, birds of, Gustavo, of Southern I, Central America. Gustavo, I'm gonna interrupt you right now and I apologize. I need all of our listeners to please be sure to mute themselves. I'm hearing some background noises of some conversations in TV and we don't want that. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you. Well, um, this this bird, which is actually one of my favorite favorites, and one of the birds that people dream to see when they come to the tropics, tropics is the great green macaw. Critically endangered, the great green macaw um, is probably a unique story because we were able to probably bring this bird back from the doom to um, or from from critical numbers in the wild to a pretty healthy population, most throughout the Eastern lowland regions of Costa Rica. Um, all right, so let me see, I'm having a little uh, trouble. Let's see if I can fix this problem real quick and I'll be... All right, okie dokie. Can everybody see this? I see it. Okay, perfect. So, um, I, yeah, okay, well, this is, let's start with uh, with a Costa Rica map. Costa Rica is, uh, uh, and let's just 
Let me just give you a few uh, statistics about the country. Many of you have been to Costa Rica. It's a very small country uh, in, the, in Southern Central America. We border to the South with Panama, to the North with Nicaragua, to the East with the Caribbean Sea and to the West with the Pacific. There is here, there's an island um, called Cocos Island, which belongs to Costa Rica, is not, uh, is not in the position where the map shows. It's actually closer to, to Galapagos Islands, to the Galapagos Archipelago, and is 500 miles uh, west, southwest of Costa Rica. So it's actually very, very far from the continent, but it belongs to what it was claimed in, in the past by, by the Costa Rican government. And it belongs to us. Interestingly, and I want to showcase that to everyone because interestingly, three out of the seven endemic species of birds um, of Costa Rica are found in the island. So um, Costa Rica is about the size of West Virginia. It's a very small country, 20,000 plus uh, square miles um, is approximately 300 miles long. So from these from the tip here by the border of Nicaragua to pretty much over here, it's approximately 300 miles. So I would figured, I'm gonna take a rough guess. I, I think it's just like driving from Chicago to St. Louis. And well, if you correct me if I'm wrong at the end of this talk, but I think that's pretty much what it is. And from here to about here is about 75 miles. So it's, it's a very tiny country. Um, incredibly, Costa Rica contains, um, to the present day, 922 species of birds. Back in the day, back in 1997, when I started birding, uh, there were only 840 species of birds. And the curious thing is that when I started birding, uh, I started with... Uh, uh, well, if you if you compare it to what it is today, I started with a very rudimentary pair of binoculars. There weren't any existing field guides, and everything was more on the technical side. If you want to get into birds, rather than all those gadgets, gadgets applications, uh, the technology in our hands to actually go and see birds. Um, so, 840 species was pretty much the total count for Costa Rica back in the 1980s. And today the count is 922 and, and probably counting. So uh, our, it, within these 922 bird species, we count um, 80 plus families. Out of these 922 species, 200 species are migratory birds that migrate from North America into the Central American tropics and South America on the yearly basis, and seven uh, species are endemic. We also have 60 species of birds that are considered regional endemics. What I mean by that is that these regional endemic birds are either found only in, in some portions of Costa Rica, like in the very south, including Panama and nowhere else in the world, or in some portions of Nicaragua and Costa Rica and nowhere else in the world. We have 60 of those. So um, this is uh, what makes Costa Rica incredibly, inc incredibly, uh, uh, I would say a superlative country in that regard. Uh, talking about, uh, um, bird diversity per unit area. Uh, there's no other country in, in the American tropics that has more birds per unit area than Costa Rica. We get approximately uh, in, in, 100, um, in 100 hectares, we could probably have a, a higher percentage of birds or bird species than anywhere in tropical America. So, I'm gonna take you back. Uh, I don't wanna take you back too far. I'm just gonna take you back 60 million years ago. Um, the, the history of the formation of Central America perhaps dates back to approximately 200 million years ago, but I wanna go, I wanna take you to 60 million years ago 
when the when plate tectonics came into collision here in this region of Central America, I'm going to I'm going to move the arrow right here and put it right in this area. Back in the day, uh, before before this time, there wasn't anything in in what it is today. Uh, Central America. So North America used to go as far south as probably northern Honduras and part of Nicaragua and South America, probably what it is today, northern Colombia. And there was nothing in between. As a result of these uh, collisions, uh, violent collisions between the Cocos plate, which is a, a, a medium-sized plate tectonic or tectonic plate in this region of the planet, against the Caribbean plate right around here, a series or a little archipelago of volcanic, of volcanic islands emerge from, from the bottom of the ocean approximately 60 million years ago. With the ability to fly uh, a few uh, species of birds uh, took a leap from the main continent into the volcanic islands. And then there were the first to colonize at the time. And I will show you later on in the talk, uh, some of the species that came in first into this volcanic archipelago. Approximately uh, 25, 24 million years ago, um, the formation of uh, another mountain range, much farther south, actually closer to Panama, uh, emerged from uh, the, bottom of, the bottom of the ocean, and then starts to give a little bit of the uh, present shape of Costa Rica. Right here, we see part of the Osa Peninsula, uh, which is the far, the far southwest of Costa Rica, the central region of Costa Rica, and the northwest, which was the first to emerge um, approximately 25, 24 million years ago. Um, probably a little bit east of its present position, um, the tallest mountain range of Costa Rica emerged from the bottom of the ocean, and it's better known as the Talamanca mountain range today. Interestingly, most of this um, land connection was intimately associated to uh, the Isthmus of Panama and the northwestern region of Colombia. We are going to continue here and see another image that showcase um, a little bit of the formation of Costa Rica. You can see here some of the um, first Costa Rica territory that emerged approximately 60 million years ago. Then the Northern uh, Archipelago, Volcanic Archipelago, I was showcasing before. And finally, the Tanalmancas, that came into pretty much into its present position about three million years ago. Um, throughout the, the history of this fascinating geological formation of Southern Central America, all these gaps you see here were filling by erosion and sediments forming alluvial plains that extend all the way to the actual um, configuration of, of the country. Right here we have um, the map of Central America, a, a pretty much like a relief map, starting in Guatemala right here, right up in the north. Notice that this northern region of Central America is very mountainous as well. Um, Nicaragua probably doesn't have as many mountains and Costa Rica particularly, uh, particularly hilly, a lot of rolling terrain everywhere you go in Costa Rica. And, and those of you who have been to Costa Rica know what I'm talking about. A little bit of this in uh, Northern Panama and the rest of the Isthmus doesn't have as many mountains. And right here is where uh, Colombia uh, is located at. Uh, there's a, an incredible bird affinity with uh, the Northeastern part of Colombia and the northwestern part of Colombia, the majority of species there were separated by the, by the Colombian Andes. And remember right out there, Nazca was doing uh, its share, uh, for, uh, forging uh, 
the Andes and, and the configuration of, of the Andes in Colombia. Three different um, Andean mountain ranges are found in Colombia, the Eastern Andes, the Central Andes, and the Western Andes. And most of the birds in the Western Andes were at least a very representative percentage of the birds of the Western Andes were somehow um, particularly prone to migrate in this direction towards Southern Central America versus the opposite direction because the Andes themselves became a major barrier and an obstacle uh, for their migration. Okay, let me show you another graphic here, another image. Approximately 3 million years ago, um, with the completion of the uh, Central American Isthmus, then we have uh, a land bridge, a major connection between North America and South America. Um, and of course, the megafauna that lived in North America had a, a, a pretty much like a ticket to go through um, the Central American Isthmus and, and, and colonize South America. And at the same time, um, South American species had the opportunity to come across Central America and migrate south. Since South America had, had been in complete isolation for millions of years, as well as North America, there was a major difference between uh, the, the mammals that were living in South America at the time, the majority of them being marsupials and other species of animals that we still have and we still find in some of the Central American jungles today. North America contributed immensely with some other species, many of which were fully placental mammals. They had an advantage and a, a clear advantage uh, to the non-placental mammals. And of course, they predated very rapidly on many species, take them uh, or force them to extinction uh, very rapidly. Uh, of, of those groups, probably the opossums are the ones that uh, clearly um, survived with great success. Uh, and some, some species were able to migrate to North America as well as armadillos. Others can be found in Northern, uh, in Central America, all the way up to probably Southern Mexico, like anteaters, armadillos, monkeys, and many other charismatic species that have their origins in South America. And of course, when people travel to South, Amer to South America or Central America in this case, of course, besides seeing the wonderful birds we have here, they also want to see the charismatic mammals that have so much to represent from these great Ameri American biotic interchange. In our next graphic, I, I want to show you uh, the uh, layout of Central America with the completion of the Central American Isthmus and, and this clear passage between these two major land masses. Many species of birds found um, very conducive to actually migrate into Costa Rica and established. Um, when, when Central America was completed, of course, uh, and, and right before the, the completion of Central America, the ocean currents were free to go between these oceans, the Caribbean and the Pacific. It was probably one single unit. With the completion of, of, of Costa Rica, of course, we have a, a, a major change in ocean currents, a major climatic change that had major and severe impact in weather conditions throughout uh, probably the entire planet. So as a result of that, the Gulf Stream went up north, reached North America, brought in moisture to North America and Europe, and of course, uh, caused probably a major drop in temperature conditions, probably uh, um, unleashing uh, the ice age that people are familiar with in the last 3 million years that finished approximately uh, uh, about 11,000 years ago. Um, during the last 10,000, 11,000, 10,000 years, Central America and, and the tropics in general have been pretty stable, climatically speaking. So there have not been major climatic changes. And that is a facilitating factor for uh, rainforest to, to grow without any kind of 
uh, major obstacles in the entire Southern Central American region and throughout Central America, in fact. Probably Costa Rica was all forested once, completely covered in forest and many South American bird species that were living in similar habitats found it very conducive and very practical to a certain extent to migrate a short distance from Colombia into Panama and finally into Southern Costa Rica. Scientists believe that a great deal of uh, species of birds probably evolved in Southern Costa Rica and the mountains of Southern Costa Rica and Northern Panama are extremely, extremely unique in biodiversity. Fortunately, and we will talk about these later in the talk, the government of Costa Rica was wise enough to set aside a very important track of virgin rainforest in the Southern mountains of Costa Rica that protect over a million acres of virgin forest and critical habitats that cannot be found anywhere else on the planet. Let me show you the next graphic right here. And this is a relief map of Costa Rica. And it shows you how Costa really is rolling, rolling uh, uh, terrain for the most part. I mean, uh, San Jose is pretty much around here, the capital city around 3000 feet above sea level surrounded by volcanoes. Look at this chain of uh, active volcanoes right here. Um, this one being the tallest, uh, one of the tallest volcanoes of Central America called Irazu, about 11,000 feet from sea level. More volcanoes up in the north right here. And alluvial plains, these are, you know, all these plains were formed by sedimentary rock in the past and the erosion process that this whole area underwent through this uh, very intriguing geological past. Right here is Nicaragua, and this is a lake, it's called Lake Nicaragua. It's one of the uh, largest freshwater lakes anywhere in Southern Central America. And we share this phenomenal mountain range called Talamanca, which, has, which, has, which I, I just uh, spoke about with, uh, with Panama right here. So right here in these mountains and Southern Costa Rica is where we concentrate the largest number of endemic species of Costa Rica regarding birds, as well as near endemic species. The Southwestern Peninsula right here called Corcovado and the Osa Peninsula also harbors a great deal of endemic species in Costa Rica. All right, let's, uh, let's move to the next graphic right here or the next image. And uh, this, image uh, showcase um, uh, the tropical bird uh, belt that surrounds the planet. So Costa Rica, this is the equator right here. And as you can see, look at Costa Rica right here. Um, in fact, my arrow is gonna blockade the entire view of it. It's, it is somewhere around, well, let's say here to, well, let's flip the arrow backwards to the left and that's where Costa Rica is. It's that little arrow's got a mind of its own. But anyway, that's where Costa Rica, we're just 10 degrees north of the equator. This is Northwest Colombia right here, right in this area. And I was just speaking that Northwest Colombia avifauna has a lot to do with Southern Costa Rica and Panama avifauna. It's extremely rich and extremely diverse. Um, just 10 degrees north of the equator. Remember when you are so close to the equator, you have almost 12 exact hours of daylight during the day with very little variations between the shortest day of the, of the year and the longest day of the year. Little, little variations in terms of daylight. And when you're in, in a place like this, where you enjoy almost 12 hours of light per day, you're talking about the maximum amount of solar radiation rainforests can get, producing tremendous amount of energy that will harbor thousands of organisms of different species 
of the species that will concentrate in such a tiny area, welcoming so many different kinds of birds, vertebrates of all types. And in fact, the animal kingdom in general is very well represented in such an insignificant portion of land in the tropics. As you can see, most of the, I would say the most representative biologically diverse countries of the planet are located in this tropical bird uh, belt within the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. As you can see, many of these countries in Africa, Asia, Southeast Asia, and Tropical America are countries that politic politically have been conflicted, warfare, narco traffic, um, you name it. I mean, all kinds of, of, of different problems that have been happening in areas like this that to a certain extent compromise the reaches by diverse regions of the planet. Costa Rica, fortunately, is like a special case scenario in the great scheme of things. Uh, we were able to abolish our armed forces back in 1948, and the peaceful way of, the, of Costa Ricans have led us to incredible efforts of conservation. We have made our mistakes, as we will learn during the talk later, but uh, we have been able to um, revert the whole process of um, systematic dis destruction of our, ha of our rainforests in the past to actually turn Costa Rica into an example to the world on um, biological conservation. Let me show you the next graphic right here. And we, I wanna talk about the weather. And actually Stacy was uh, talking about the weather later on and I, or earlier in the presentation. And I said to her that later on in the talk, I was gonna tell her why that happened. Well, I just, I just told you that, Costa, that, that this region of the world is climatically super stable and, and it's been that way for the last 10,000 years. And um, so Costa Rica, it's, it's, it's got only two, two seasons, two well-defined seasons, if you will. Um, one is called the dry season and the other one is, is the wet season. And we have a, a, a low pressure air mass called the Intertropical Convergence Zone. Um, so here's the acronym ITCZ. Uh, the Intertropical Convergence Zone is a low pressure air mass that positions itself in the northern half of South America and kind of shifts to the north in certain times of the year and shifts back into its original position in certain times of the year. In Costa Rica, the intertropical convergence zone uh, shifts in, in around the month of May. When that happens, uh, this low pressure air mass blockades the trade winds that come from North America directly into Central America and as it blockades, these trade winds uh, will increase precipitation. So that's exactly, uh, so ignore this July right here. Usually for Costa Rica starts in May. So the rainy season starts pretty much in May and ends around December, around this time of the year. And that's what I was telling Stacy that at this time of the year, when the intertropical convergence zone goes back to South America, trade winds kick back in from North America. And of course, at times they bring these polar systems making, making these trade winds to be very chilly for tropical standards. Um, so these trade winds uh, will also be accompanied by a lot of moisture uh, that will probably end up in the Eastern side of Costa Rica. And let me show you here another graphic on how this works. So this is uh, the, the weather in Costa Rica. The Caribbean side here, 
on the Pacific side right over here. So at this time of the year, we're having the trade winds coming from the Northeast, right? Bringing uh, a lot of moisture into the Caribbean region of Costa Rica, right? This whole part of Costa Rica is called the Caribbean side. So uh, the continental divide, you can see the line, the blue line of the continental divide so the water draining this way will drain to the Caribbean Sea and the water draining this way will drain to the Pacific. So this area of Costa Rica is also known by people as the Caribbean slope. So at this time of the year, December, January, February, right? When we have the trade winds pretty active in Costa Rica, you could expect to have a lot of moisture, a lot of rain, if you will. Um, in the eastern side of Costa Rica. So when you when you learn, in, in general, when you learn about Costa Rica, you learn that Costa Rica around December is already enjoying the dry season. And when you go there to the Caribbean side to look for birds and it's soaking wet, you go like, oh my goodness, what the, what is going on? But really what's going on is that all these convectional systems are staying on the Caribbean side and these mountains are so high that we have some rain shadow effect, right? Only, only winds with no moisture will pass on to the Pacific side. So most of the Pacific side at this time of the year is pretty much enjoying a fairly good weather, pretty stable weather through most throughout. Occasionally still in December, the intertropical convergence zone for these awkward weather phenomenon moves in a little bit into southern Costa Rica causing precipitation right here, but then finally recedes to North America around January to not to return until, uh, until May. All right, let's move on to our next graphic. And so this is what I, what I was trying to uh, show you before. The whole eastern watershed uh, of Costa Rica uh, received all these all this moisture, all this rain that um, that stays in, in in the fashion of a of convectional rain on the eastern side, and of course the rising air will pass over um, to meet the dry air of the western side, which will start present a rain shadow effect. So the whole Western region of Costa Rica will start to go through a very incredible transformation um, from being very green, if you will, in the wet season from May to December to being very, very dry from December to May. And of course, all these weather patterns create um, incredible opportunities for different species of birds to uh, find niches uh, in different parts of the country. And we will talk about uh, climatic zones um, in just a little while. But I just wanted to show you here some of the bird families that, that colonized the volcanic islands at the very beginning, um, millions of years back. So uh, here I'm just showcasing some of the actual groups of birds that live in Costa Rica, the original species, like herons, for example, um, colonize some of these volcanic islands, pigeons, cuckoos, swifts, hawks, Amazons, Amazon parrots, and rails are amongst the, 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 some of the uh, bird species that uh, colonize volcanic islands. All right, uh, these are some of the birds that came from, from the south, taking advantage of um, the forested area. Remember that Costa Rica was pretty forested, if not all forested. And many of the South American species of that region of uh, Northwest, Northeast Colombia came very happily across the isthmus of Panama into the very heavily forested regions of Costa Rica. They didn't have any troubles finding habitat to live and thrive and evolve into completely new species. Um, we find we found tinamous in this group, and birds, mannequins, jacamars, 
pot birds, wood creepers, and toucans. And some of these photos that I'm showcasing tonight are um, or, or are pretty representative of some of, of the local uh, species that can be found in different types of habitats in Costa Rica. So uh, um, here you go. I mean, uh, we, we have incredible variety uh, of, of Costa Rican birds. Most of these birds, because they were found in the lower regions of Colombia, um, stayed pretty much like in the lower regions of the forested part of Costa Rica near the coast. So um, we're gonna move on a little bit to another graphic here. These birds um, that I'm showcasing here arrive after the completion of the isthmus of, of Central America. Um, so um, we're talking about hummingbirds, we're talking about flycatchers, we're talking about tanagers, we're talking about icterids, um, icterids in the, in the fashion of orioles, in the fashion of caciques, uh, as the name suggests here, in the fashion of oropendulas, and honey creepers, which probably came in when, when the isthmus was completed. Uh, so honey, honey creepers were probably the last in to arrive in Central America. So all these birds are of, of South American origin. This is an interesting thing. Um, Costa Rica, despite the fact that it was all forested by the time Spaniards arrived, the first thing they started doing was to destroy the forest, to introduce uh, cattle as a, as a, as, as, as a sort of, uh, um, uh, as a way of making a living, if you will. So uh, deforestation didn't stop there. It continued until, until pr pretty much the, the end of the 20th century. Uh, and with these gaps open throughout uh, many regions of Central America, you know, it opened up new possibilities for different groups of birds to actually colonize Costa Rica. We speak of caracaras in the upper left-hand corner here. We speak of uh, meadowlarks. Some species of meadowlarks came, came into Costa Rica. Uh, egrets, annies right here, which are re related to cuckoos spine tails and uh, quails, of course, um, came, some species of quails came in with, uh, with deforestation as well. We're gonna move to the next graphic right here. And uh, these are birds of North American origin that arrived uh, when the isthmus was completed. And we see here uh, in this graphic, um, some swallows, quails, right? Uh, finches. Uh, I want I want you to notice this, and um, there's an N E in some birds, or an E in some of the other birds. Um, what we try to do here is that for this bird in particular, the large-footed finch, you're looking at a near endemic Costa Rican bird. So the large-footed finch is a bird that you can find in the higher Talamanca Mountains in the part, southern part of Costa Rica, and it's a near endemic. Uh, we only share this bird with Panama in the northernmost half of the country. Owls also came in, um, gnatcatchers and, and thrushes. This is a, the black-billed nightingale thrush, where the arrow is, another near endemic bird of Costa Rica. Okay, motmots are birds or of North American, Northern Mesoamerica origin. That means that they came from uh, probably Southern Mexico, Guatemala, that area. Oops, but there's a long tailed silky flycatcher. This guy belongs to the previous graphic that I show you, but I just didn't have space to put it in there. So I wanted to showcase the long-tailed silky flycatcher, which is a near endemic as well, found in the Southern Talamanca region. 
And this guy is not a Mahatma. This guy not Neil, not actually related to Mahatmas. This guy is more related to uh, wax wings. Um, and it's one of the most beautiful birds found in the southern mountains of Costa Rica. But going back to Mahatmas here on the left. Um, sorry. Uh, going back to Mahatmas here on the left. Uh, we start with the Broadbill Mahatmas. The lesson, Lessons Matmut, which has been splitted several times and has been considered different species in, within Central America, within that broad range, I would say. And in Costa Rica, it used to be called the Blue Crown Matmut. Now we call it the Lessons Matmut. And the Rufus Matmut, which is one of the largest Matmuts here in Costa Rica. We have many other species. They're extremely char charismatic birds. Um, they take the ecological niche of rollers in Africa. For those of you who have been to Africa, they even have similar looks to rollers. They're beautiful looking birds, iridescent feathers. Um, they are very cooperative. So when you're birding in the woods and you find them, they usually stay for you to behold their beauty and take photos. These are phenomenal birds. So, uh, and easy to find. There's only probably one or two species that are very, very tough to find. Uh, these are birds uh, that of South American origin that became successful in North America. Um, actually, some of these uh, groups of birds or families of birds became very successful in North America, but some of them, um, still are pretty attached to their homes. And, and so they make annual migrations to North America and then back to South America again. This is the Baltimore Oriole in the upper left-hand corner. This is the bird I fell in love with when I was a kid. And the bird I couldn't understand why he disappeared and the rest would stay. Virios. Look at this one, for example. This is the yellow-winged Virio. Yellow-winged Virio of... Uh, Andean affinity, um, Andean meaning the Western Andes of Colombia, that region over there, uh, came into the Southern mountains of Costa Rica and became a near endemic bird. We only find this bird in Southern Costa Rica and Northern Panama, nowhere else in the world. Brown cap vireo, another vireo that didn't want to migrate all the way to North America and was very happy in the mountains of Costa Rica. And here is the flame-throated warbler. Look at the E right here. This is an endemic bird. The flame-throated warbler, well, probably was not feeling well to migrate all the way to North America and stayed in the oak forests of Southern Costa Rica. This is a beautiful little bird, uh, relatively easy to find. And, and one of those highlights when people visit the high mountains of Southern Costa Rica. Wrens have uh, their origins in Mexico, and many of them, well, migrated north to where you guys are, and some of them migrated south to where we are. And they find um, incredible possibilities and, and completely different niches um, where to be expected and where to be found. Here's the bay wren on the uh, left-hand side. All these birds are superb songsters. Bay wren, if you, well, now it's so simple because you can use the eBird and you can just go to eBird and find the uh, bay wren and play back its call. And it's absolutely incredible. Um, the banded wren is another incredible wren found mostly in the eastern side of Costa Rica. And the song wren, most of these wrens are, are wrens found in rainforests. Very few species of wrens are found in the very highlands. The majority are in lowland forests. All of these wrens um, feed on insects. This one in particular, the song wren, you have to go to eBird and find the song of this bird. It's absolutely incredible. But the song wren is a, bird, a, a specialist because this bird follows army ants in, in the tropical rainforest. And this is a 
probably a topic of a very different conversation, but when you visit the tropics and if you're a birder, one of the things that you're expecting to see when you're walking in, in the dense rainforest is to find a swarm of army ants. And this is on its own a spectacle. These ants are just walking through the forest floor in search of insects to, to eat. And as they do that, they flee off their path. Dozens of insects that are escaping away from the mandibles of these fearful ants. And from above, dozens of species of birds, including ant birds, including wood creepers, wrens, and various others are waiting patiently for these insects to flee off their path to capture them and eat them. So this bird does that with other species of birds and is an absolutely a joy to see him when you find a swarm of, ar of army ants. So this is one of the highlights. And one of the things that the birders are expected to see when they visit, um, when they visit Costa Rica. These are birds um, of the Western section of Central America that came into the Northwest half of Costa Rica. So uh, pretty soon I'll show you other graphics um, that will help you understand uh, how dynamic Costa Rica is in terms of weather patterns, despite the fact that Costa Rica is such a tiny little country. Uh, the whole West Coast of Central America, including the Northwest part of Costa Rica is extremely dry in certain parts of the year and only certain birds can be found right there and nowhere else in Costa Rica. So many of these bird species can be found there and along the West Coast of Nicaragua and El Salvador and pretty much nowhere else in the world. So it's a whole new set of birds um, and whole new possibilities. Uh, many of these birds are used to open country. Um, they don't really need dense rainforest as many of the other birds I showcased before. So they are relatively easy to spot. Um, sparrows, for example, like striped-headed sparrows, grackles, like the great, great tail grackle, white-fronted Amazon is one of them. Uh, Spot-breasted oriole, Inca dove, um, the name kind of suggests that this bird probably came from South America, but it's a bird that has been always, or for at least a very long, long time in the West Coast of Central America. Look at this lesser, lesser ground cuckoo. Um, this bird has a very interesting behavior and remind us that one of the roadrunner back at home, um, always on the ground, very tiny bird occasionally comes out to nail an insect or a small vertebrate and go, goes back into the brush. Interesting behavior and a bird that can be found in thickets and brush uh, vegetation uh, near the edges of the forest. And of course, the cinnamon hummingbird on the bottom right. Let's move to another graphic. Um, these are birds of Andean affinity that arrive to Costa Rica during the Pleistocene glaciation and um, found a pretty wonderful home to live in, in the Talamanca Mountains. Those mountains also underwent glaciation back in the day. And uh, after that um, glaciation process was, was over, a pretty stable weather um, empire for the last 10,000 years. Many of these, uh, these birds are, are only found in this part of Costa Rica, the southwest part of Costa Rica, and they have a great affinity to the birds of the Western Andes. So, for example, the red spine, red faced spine tail, um, it's found in the highlands of Costa Rica in the oak forest. This lady flowered piercer, uh, which is a, a, a Western Andy and Central and Eastern Andy type of, of, of bird species. That's, that's where the majority of flower piercers can be found. We still have some species here of flower piercers. This is probably the commonest. And it's actually a near endemic, as you can see. The silvery fronted tapaculo, another bird from of Andean affinity. And this particular species also uh, a near endemic. The hairy woodpecker, this is the Costa Rican subspecies. 
remember that many species of woodpeckers have their uh, uh, ratio of dispersation in South America. And, and, and many of them, of course, when the continents worked together, ended up in Africa and Asia, and then migrating across the isthmus to North America. Some species of, some species of woodpeckers did that. This is the Costa Rica hairy woodpecker. It's a little bit, probably a little bit different than yours. This is the Buffy tufted cheek. Listen to that name. This is a bird that can be found in um, Highland Oak Forest in Costa Rica. It's not an easy bird to find. It's usually um, a very tough bird to find. But well, uh, when Randy was here with me last time, I think it was uh, last April, uh, we were looking for this bird. Um, everywhere, and it was tough to find. I don't remember if we ever saw it or not. Maybe Randy can tell us later, but but uh, it's a tough bird. Uh, the ruddy tree runner, uh, probably a little easier to find. Um, so these, these, uh, these birds are very unique to uh, the South, South, to South America and Southern Central America. And finally, the volcano jungle, which is found above timberline. So you have to go up to elevations close to 12,000, 10,000 and 12,000 feet to find the volcano jungle in the Talamanca mountain range. And this guy is a near endemic, of course. These are Costa Rican bird super species. Um, the term superspecies means that each, each one of these pairs of birds evolved from a common ancestor and, and they became isolated by geographic, by geographic uh, uh, mountains or geographic isolation in this case. So these mountain ranges became uh, a major locating factor that separated uh, populations and turn them into separate species in the course of time. This is the Bay Ren right here, uh, where the arrow is, uh, a resident of lowland regions of the Eastern watershed. And this is the Riverside Ren, uh, an endemic, a resident of the Southwest part of Costa Rica. Uh, let's go down here to the left real quick. Look at these two little uh, white color birds, snowy color birds. And um, probably you already saw the difference between these two guys. The snowy Cotinga, um, a near endemic. This guy is, is a lowland forest uh, inhabitant of the Eastern Caribbean lowlands of Costa Rica. And the yellow belly Cotinga is uh, a resident of the lowlands of the, of the Southern Western part of Costa Rica. Now let's go to the mannequin sector, uh, section right here. And I wanna showcase the white color mannequin, resident of the Eastern watershed of Costa Rica, lowland forest, and the orange color mannequin, a resident of the lowland forest of the Southwest of Costa Rica. Also, as you can see right here, a near endemic. Let's move to the toucans. Uh, we have several species of toucans, but only these two evolved from a common ancestor. One is the colored arasari. That's how we, we pronounce this name, colored arasari. And uh, down below, an, another near endemic, uh, the uh, fiery billed arasari. Notice the coloration of the beak, absolutely impressive. Resident, this guy, the colored arasari, a resident of the lowland regions of the eastern watershed, and the fiery bill arasari, a resident of the southwest rainforests in the Oza Peninsula, and up to the central Pacific slope as well. Look at the charming hummingbird, a resident of uh, the southern region of Costa Rica, from the central Pacific all the way to the southwest and the blue-chested hummingbird on the left, which is a resident of the lowland regions of the Eastern Caribbean slope. If you look at the two of them in the field, you, you, would, be, you would be puzzled. Probably you wouldn't be able to tell the differences between these two. But of course, the mountain separation will 
will be a fundamental factor to know that you're looking to either or, depending on where you are in Costa Rica. All right, let's move to uh, the next graphic right here. And uh, well, we, we've, we've been through uh, a wonderful collection of birds and, and bird species, depending on the, uh, <clears throat> on the region of Costa Rica we're at. And I just wanna um, showcase how Costa Rica um, could not stop a growing deforestation process in the past that, that took our incredible biological diversity to almost be doomed by 1987. We, we made a huge mistake in the past. Um, our deforestation rates were appalling. We were destroying rainforest systematically to open space for beef cattle. And we were simply not paying attention to, to what we're doing. And we lost most of these incredibly diverse rainforest regions throughout the entire country. In 1940, a group of scientists around this time when Costa Rica was still pretty forested, where the arrow is, 1940 right here, a, a very large group of scientists were already established in Costa Rica doing scientific research on a variety of different topics. And in the course of time, throughout several decades, until probably 1970, 1960, 1970, pretty much about here, most of the scientists were already making publications to uh, their phenomenal scientific discoveries. Is Pretty much around 1972, 1973, when the government is alerted by the scientific community to do something about the conservation of the most critical habitats that represent unique ecosystems throughout the country. And in, in 1970, Costa Rica started to create systematically and for the following decade the national park system we have today in Costa Rica. So pretty much around here, between 1983, all the national park systems were created. Deforestation, unfortunately, continued from 1977 until 19, pretty much around 1983, when they just couldn't go any further because the protected land already belonged to the government. Years passed and Costa Rica received a second alert from the scientific community saying this time that all of the biological diversity contained within these national parks was in critical, in critical conditions. We, if we didn't revert this deforestation process and this phenomenon of pockets of greenery in our national park system, in few decades, probably we would end up losing the biological diversity and the bird diversity of Costa Rica. In a four-sided act of wisdom, the Costa Rican government creates or comes up with a brilliant idea. The Costa Rican government makes a proposal of a conservation easement um, initiative to um, embrace the entire country and make every owner of land in Costa Rica to participate of it. And a lot of people sign up for this. Back in the day, we started to experiment increments in the price of gasoline. Um, and those increments in the price of gasoline were there to finance these environmental uh, easement initiative. And a lot of farmers that previously had deforested their land decided to sign up for this initiative and be paid by the Costa Rican government an equivalent of about 85 US dollars per every two and a half, two and a half acres of land they preserve. So very progressively, the satellite was showing 
that Costa Rica or showcasing that Costa Rica was very slowly gaining back its forest and more importantly, connecting the national parks were, were in total isolation with other existing national parks in the vicinity. With that incredible initiative, this is, this is the latest uh, map I was able to find, um, 2014, and I just read a couple of days ago that a satellite image of Costa Rica showcased that 60%, 6 60% of the total continental mass of the country is covered in forest today, which is absolutely something to be proud of after all we went through in the past. Back in 1940, uh, a scientist whose name was Leslie Holdridge came up with the life zones of Costa Rica. Um, life zones are are defined by um, a, series, a series of different um, variables and different ingredients. Um, one is rainfall. Remember that Costa Rica has different rain patterns all throughout the country. Rainfall, humidity, um, wind speed, uh, moisture, solar radiation. And believe it or not, we have approximately 16 of those um, life zones within seven major or six major ecoregions within the country. So each one of these colors has a meaning and has um, a very unique meaning uh, telling us that each and every region, no matter how, where you go in Costa Rica, will have a very unique space, unique habitat, unique microclimatic region that will harbor a number of species of birds and other, and other critters, hundreds of, of critters that will be uh, contained within very small spaces. And that's why Costa Rica has got the largest density of birds per unit area anywhere in the tropics, because right now we have been able to conserve so much forest in such a tiny little place that contains 922 species of birds. So uh, birds are doing fairly, fairly well in Costa Rica. When the weather gets critical over here, uh, birds will make an altitudinal migration to a lower elevation in search of better weather and food sources. So birds are constantly making altitudinal migrations from lower elevations to higher elevations. And many birds pretty much stay in certain habitats depending on, on the types of foods they like to eat. Insect eating birds tend to stay more in certain areas and move very little. Fruit eating birds and nectar eating birds like hummingbirds, for instance, tend to be more mobile. So remember that Costa Rica, uh, Panama and probably Colombia well, not probably, Colombia, Costa Rica, and Panama are all three the world capital of hummingbirds. So if one of your desires is to see hummingbirds in the tropics, certainly Costa Rica is a good place to start. All right, so now um, I, wanna, I wanna showcase the different uh, life zones in Costa Rica or different ecological zones, I would say ecological re uh, regions. So here's the map of Costa Rica. You see all the different colors. I'm going to take you real quick through the different ecological regions and show you pretty much how they look like. Let's start with the following area. This is the dry northwest. Uh, let me show you here with the arrow where we are. So let me take you to here, right where the arrow is. That area in yellow is called Guanacaste. That's the name of the whole province. And it's where 
Uh, the driest part of Costa Rica is located at. Precipitation patterns vary tremendously right there. Um, highest uh, rain uh, rainfall we get is approximately 40 to 50 inches of rainfall per year. Here are the dividing mountains between uh, Guanacaste lower um, regions to the Northern Plains here in red. And the Northern Plains are significantly wetter. It rains three times or four times as much right here than it does over here. And the critical factor to make this possible are the dividing mountains. You can see right here down below the map. So we have in the upper left corner, the, the rain shadow effect. Remember the convectional rains we were talking about before, how they rise to approximately 7,000, 8,000 feet right here in these mountains. Look at this cloud cover, right? Meeting the dry air of the Northwest. You can see it right here. So all of the moisture stays in the Eastern watershed, right? And very little of that moisture passes across bathing these cloud forests in the higher portion of the mountains and reaching the coast, virtually turning into dry air. But it rains still enough here to maintain wetlands all over Guanacaste. That's one of the things that Guanacaste is, uh, is, uh, is good for. A lot of waterfowl and uh, herons, egrets, uh, water birds in general are found right here. Lots of uh, seed eaters. Stuff like that can be found in grass, grassland areas like here, which is a typical type of uh, landscape for Guanacaste. So in the wet season, this is the exact same photo. Look on the left-hand side, how dry it is, right? In the dry season from December till May. And when the tropical convergence zone moves into Costa Rica, starts to rain, and then the foliage comes back and look how it is. I mean, completely different. You, you would not believe how these changes are possible, but it's only because of these phenomenal weather systems. These kind of habitats are, are tough for a lot of birds. Only certain species of birds can take these very dry um, conditions and changing conditions as well besides the waterfowl and other birds that I've been talking about. Here's the scrub euphonia, which is a typical euphonia of the um, dry uh, area of the northwest part of Costa Rica. The long-tailed mannequin is an absolutely gorgeous bird, which likes this type of habitats, very dry forests. Um, and it can tolerate moisture right here. Um, to a certain extent, when it gets super, super rainy, the long-tailed mannequin actually can migrate to areas where the weather will be more benign. They, in the regular basis, they wouldn't do that, but I, but I have seen in long-tailed mannequins in areas where they should not be living at all. Uh, and this would be temporarily, of course. Tinamoos, of course, Thick thicket tinamoo is another one that you can find in very dry habitats like this. And when you're birding in very dry habitats like this, birding is actually easier than birding in areas like this, all covered with forests. Okay, we're gonna move to another ecological region. We're gonna move to the Northern Plains here in red. Um, so that whole red region of Costa Rica are the Northern Plains. We have the influence of Lake Nicaragua being nearby and all the water, all the rivers that, rain, that drain from the upper mountains into the eastern side, northeastern side of Costa Rica. Also, uh, one of the main characteristics there is the incredible river system that one, that one can find in that, in that region of the country. Um, lots of wetlands, so you can find um, birds like jabiru in certain times of the year. Um, by the way, jabiru is, is in critical conditions in Costa Rica. Um, 
just a handful of, of, of breeding pairs are surviving in the country right now. Um, so that makes it hard to find the Jabiru, but there are certain times of the year where you can go see them in this area of Costa Rica. Broadbill motmots can be found in these wetland regions, uh, boat, bill heron, and black colored hawk uh, is a raptor that is intimately associated with uh, wetland regions in the country. Precipitation patterns in this part of Costa Rica, 200 uh, to 250 inches of rainfall per year. The Caribbean lowlands, the Caribbean lowlands are situated in green right here in the Eastern region of Costa Rica. Again, uh, the Northern Caribbean lowlands are, are typically wetlands. Only the Southern Caribbean is probably more uh, terra firma like because we have the uh, uh, presence of the Talamanca mountains around here. So um, it's, it, it's, it's interesting how this uh, lower Talamanca would look like in comparison to the upper Northeastern, uh, Northeastern lowland regions of uh, the Caribbean lowlands. So this is, this is a park called Tortuguero National Park, one of the largest ecological units in, in Costa Rica that borders another huge preserve in the southern part of Nicaragua. And it's all forested, as you can see, but the only way to explore this park is by using boats. It's an absolutely spectacular park. It's, absolute, it's an absolute treasure. It's pretty much like being in the Amazon, but here in Central America. Things like great curassaws can be found there. Purple-throated fruit crows, which are cotingas, it's like a whole group of birds that we have not uh, touched bases with or not spoke about yet. Mannequins of many species, including the white-colored mannequin, and the famous bare-neck umbrella bird, a near-endemic cotinga, um, and you know, only found in Costa Rica and Panama and nowhere else in the world. Only two other species of umbrella birds are found. One in, uh, actually two in Colombia, uh, Venezuela, uh, and Ecuador, and nowhere else in the world. So the avifauna of these lowland regions is also very intimately connected to that one of Panama and Northwest Colombia. So again, it, it, a phenomenal, phenomenal ecoregion. All right, let's move on to uh, the Central Highlands and the Talamanca Mountains, which I, I was talking about earlier today. So south of San Jose is where the Talamancas are. And we get uh, this mountain range going all the way to Panama over 1 million acres preserved. This is how Talamanca looked like when you climb to the summit of the highest of this high mountain in Costa Rica. Above timber lines of trees don't grow there. But as you can see, you can see way in the horizon and yet we're far to get to Panama. All these mountains are covered in forest and they harbor unique species, many of which are still being found by the, by the scientific community yet. Just recently, five new species of salamanders were discovered new to science in the mountains of Costa Rica, some of which were found in Talamanca. This is how Talamanca would look like in the uppermost part. This is a type of bamboo called chasquia home of the large-footed finch, home of the timberline wren, and home of the volcano junco and the volcano hummingbird, some of the charismatic and emblematic birds of the higher elevations of Costa Rica. Below the timberline, we find the oak forest. And the oak forest is so impressive that um, I mean, no photo can actually do the justice of how beautiful these oak forests are. Much farther north, in, in above, or I would say 
northern from uh, the northernmost part of the Talamanca, we still have some volcanoes that have similar vegetation to the Talamanca Mountains, in this case, Irazu volcano. And some of the birds we can find there are the resplendent Quetzal, sacred by Mayans and Aztecs, and probably one of the most beautiful birds of the Western Hemisphere, rivals, stuff like uh, Birds of Paradise and um, some others that are absolutely incredible in some regions of other regions of the planet. But the resplendent Quetzal is absolutely beautiful in its own right. Glittering colors refracted by the light can produce different tonalities. So this photo has its uniqueness to it. It looks pretty golden on the crown, but another photo could show you blue on the crown or green on the crown. Not a single photo of the Quetzal would be identical. They're all different simply because the light will always play a trick on the final effect of your photo. The scintillant hummingbird in the lower left is another beautiful little tiny hummingbird of the highland forests of Costa Rica. The northern emerald toucanet is the only highland toucan in this part of the world. And of course, the three wattle bellbird is one of those birds that everyone wants to see. Usually found in the highland forests and it goes all the way to lowlands near the coast. It makes altitudinal migration, so one has to pretty much time the local the uh, altitudinal migrations of the three wattle bellbird in in Costa Rica to actually get to see these bird. All right, let's move on to uh, the next graphic, and we're in the southwest corner in the Oza Peninsula. Many of you have heard of the Oza Peninsula because the cocoa plate was so violent, colliding against the Caribbean plate, it, it produced this incredible effect. The ocean meets uh, these tall mountains here, completely covered in rainforests. Look at this one over here. This is how the Oza Peninsula looks like, very, very dense forest areas and loaded with endemic and near endemic birds. The black cheek ant tanager, it's a relatively easy bird to see there, an endemic to Costa Rica. The fiery bill are a sari and a near endemic uh, toucan that can be easily seen from the central Pacific part all the way to the southwest. And of course, the king vulture, one of those birds that everyone wants to see. Let's move on to the central Pacific transitional forest. And we are right here in this orange patch. The Central Pacific is more accessible and gives you, gives you access to a lot of uh, the birds that you can find in the dry Northwest and a lot of the birds that you can find in the, in the wet Southwest. Some are the, the macaws, scarlet macaws, mannequins, for example, the orange colored mannequin near endemic, the white whiskered puffer here, uh, another beautiful bird that can be found in that area. And the black hooded ant shrike, another member of the ant bird family, a near endemic that can be found in the forest of one of the local parks right there, right there called Carrara. Um, so it visited, it's visited by, by tourists all the time. It's one of the best birding spots we have on the Central Pacific Slope. This is the Tarcolis River, which uh, kind of uh, divides Carrara or splits Carrara National Park in two halves. And curiously, a lot of wading birds can be found right here, along with the largest population of American crocodiles in Costa Rica. All right. Well, um, as Randy mentioned before, we uh, many, many years ago, I purchased a 300 acre of, uh, of pristine woodland. 300-acre property of pristine woodland in the eastern watershed of Costa Rica near the Arenal volcano. My intention um, at the beginning was to um, understand the biological diversity of the place and especially the bird diversity. And we started a little biological station, which you can see right here 
uh, right of the arrow. We still preserve our, our 300 acres of woodland. Um, the biological field station has come to uh, pretty much to an end of its cycle. And in fact, Randy will, will come with a, with a group of birders next March. And that probably will be the last trip uh, that we will have uh, to the station uh, the way we have host trips in the past. The station will be closed permanently. Uh, the reason why we're closing the station is because uh, the pandemic was devastating to us in, in terms of our finances. And the superlative investment kind of impedes us to continue with the project. We will continue preserving our, our, our woodlands in tribute to the future generations. And uh, well, I, I love that area. I am still very connected to, to my property and I will still continue to return all the time to enjoy the birds and do photography, which is one of the things that I like to do as well. When you travel with us, when you travel with uh, our uh, tour company, Geonatura Tours, part of the money you pay to travel with us goes to the preservation of, of these 300 acre of woodlands in, in this part of Costa Rica, which is very unique. So um, this comes or leads to the end of the presentation. I want to to thank you for your attention. This is the Cabanis ground sparrow, an endemic bird of Costa Rica that lives only in the Central Valley. So um, thank you. I really thank you for your attention. Sorry if, if, you, if I was too long on this, uh, on this presentation. And if you wanna learn more about our tours and the products we, we have, go on in Costa Rica, just visit our website, www geonaturatours.com Thank you so much. Thank you, Gustavo. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Uh, in a moment, we'll entertain questions, but first let me introduce our vice president, Lisa Meyer. Uh, Lisa was among uh, the group of friends who visited Costa Rica under the guidance of Gustavo, and she will host our question and answer session. Lisa, are you there? Lisa, be sure to unmute. Sorry, hello. <laughs> there, there she is. Okay, and we'll also, um, Lisa, take a look at the uh, notes in the chat box too. So Lisa, it's all yours. All right, so um, in the chat, it's mostly been thank yous. Uh, request for contact information, which I did post the website um, in the uh, in the chat box, so everybody can check that out. Um, it's got the email as well as uh, I think there's a phone number listed too, but it's got a lot of information about the tours and how to get in contact if you're looking for something, you know, a little bit more custom and stuff like that. So, uh, but if anybody's got any questions, feel free to put it in the chat. Lots of thank yous. Great program. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. And folks can unmute um, yes. if they want to just reach out and ask questions. And I'll, I'll ask, um, Gustavo, were most of those photos or all of them by you? They were amazing. Well, um, actually not, Stacy. I, uh, I'm a photographer, a wildlife photographer. I, I became a wildlife photographer um, a little prior to the pandemic, and I, I, I actually studied more photography during the pandemic and got the equipment <laughs> during the time of the pandemic. So, uh, actually, I have a lot of uh, a lot of photo work with me, but I didn't want to just put it in there. Um, when I was doing the search for some of the unique species that I want to showcase, I discovered that I didn't have them, so it was much easier for me to find them online and just put them all together there. So most of those photos are not mine. My photos can be can be viewed in my website. Uh, thank you. We do have a question here. Yes, just so everybody knows this will be, it has been recorded and we'll send out the recording um, 
it's probably in a few days or so, uh, just so we can maybe more than that. Make give you know, give us a little time so we can just make sure you know it's trimmed up and looks nice. But there is a a, a question here. Um, uh, do the three wattled bellbirds migrate migrate to the field station? We always saw them in August there. Right, August is probably the best time. Um, for that part of the eastern region of, of Costa Rica to see uh, three wattle bellbirds. The rest of the time, uh, they're, they're kind of going back and forth. One of the reasons why that is is because the, the type of food that these birds are after. Uh, they feed on wild avocados. And so, for example, in August, um, August and September, there's a great number of species of wild avocados in production at the field station and that's what they come down there uh, but are, they're not all, not the only ones looking after the wild avocados we have toucans we have monkeys we have uh, umbrella birds we have a whole set of birds looking after the wild avocados so these supply of avocados will go short in a hurry so around september early september these birds will have Nothing else to eat around the station. And then they will have to migrate to the higher elevations in search of wild avocados that by then will be in production. So, uh, so that's um, the reason why. All right, thank you. I have another question here. Um, well, I'll comment that um, we're, uh, by, Di by Diana, I'm so happy and impressed by the devotion and su success of Costa Rica's conservation efforts, which I totally agree. Um, and then there's a question here. Why are Costa Rica, Panama, Colombia, such high concentration of hummingbirds? Is it vegetation, climate? Well, yeah, I think it's a combination of many factors, the climate, the position in respect to the equator, um, and the mountains, the, the, the Andes, particularly Andes and the higher Talamancas produce uh, an incredible number of species of, of, very of, of very special flowers with tubular structures and, and hence the evolution of the hummingbirds in this particular region of, of the world, more so than in other parts of the American continent. You still find hummingbirds of course, Ecuador is pretty much the same situation, uh, Colombia and parts of Venezuela. But as you go south, you don't have as many species. As you go into Peru, as you go into Brazil, you don't have as many species. So you start to drop in number of species in that area. So the Andes, particularly that region of the Andes and Southern Central America, uh, were prone to the evolution of hummingbirds. So very specific types of plants with very specific types of flowers um, were prone to the evolution of the hummingbirds. All right, uh, some more thank yous and beautiful presentation. And there's a question here from Peggy that says, how will climate change affect Costa Rica's birds? Yeah, this is a very good question. Um, well, Costa Rica, as I was telling you in the presentation, has done an incredible job conserving um, our, our rainforests. And right outside our national parks, we have huge amounts of forests that can provide um, a, a home, a, a, a place to, to hide, a place to find refuge, to some species that may be affected by, by climate change. So for example, if, and I have noticed this at the field station, there are times of the year in which we've been affected by drought or by excess of rain. And this of course um, has a significant impact in the production of the rainforest. So that means that those years we have less production, less fruit available, less insects available. And when that happens, birds are forced to migrate to areas where the climate is more benign. Fortunately, Costa Rica has these chains of mountains that still give birds an opportunity. If they are forced to migrate to areas where benign climate and, and areas where they can find food, 
they probably will do that. And proof of that is that one time at the field station, an area where we've never registered long tail mannequins, we did register long tail mannequins on a very long drought the dry Northwest went through. And so the, the long tail mannequins were forced to migrate to where we are, never seen long tail mannequins in 30 years right there. But they still had the, the, the chance, they still had the choice. If Costa Rica never, never had the chance to protect the, the amount of forest we did protect, probably all these parks would, would be in complete isolation and birds would have no choice, leading to uh, problems, leading to uh, uh, the extinction of some species. Not that we're completely free of the fact that we have an effect of climate change of, of Costa Rica, but at least having such healthy forests around us will help, help us mitigate to a certain extent the effect of climate change, hopefully for longer rather than for shorter, I would say. Gustavo, it, it uh, sounds like you're, you're saying the, um, the preservation of the biodiversity and the connectedness of all of it uh, lends to a lot of resiliency. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I have a, a private message that came through just to me that I want to share um, from Ken Click. He uh, says, as a birder and a botanist, are there guides available um, that to help him know the flora, including Latin names and families, and including the unglamorous non-showy species? Well, you can find, uh, I mean, it's very difficult to to know it all. I mean, even, I don't know if, well, if you're, if you're a botanist, you probably knew Al Gentry, one of the greatest botanists of all times. Al Gentry, who had the ability to actually uh, recognize tree species from a helicopter in the Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, soon before his death, he said that not even the world foremost expert was able to recognize plant families. Uh, in the tropics. So plant families are extremely, extremely complex in the tropics. You can find someone that can take you to the field and show you some representative families with, with names, but probably won't be able to tell you all. And you can actually talk to world foremost scientists and they will tell you exactly the same thing. So we just can go so far with that. I mean, it's... Uh, there are more than 15,000 species of vascular plants in Costa Rica, close to 2,000 species of trees. That alone is more than all the species of trees that you have in all continental United States. So it's, it's very vast, it's, it's really overwhelming. But yeah, I mean, you can go with someone like me and I can tell you to a certain extent, certain plant families, certain tree families, and certainly the birds. Um, I'm not an expert in plants. I have to recognize that. But I recognize a lot of them because they have an affinity with the birds that uh, we are always uh, interested in seeing. All right, I have two more questions in the chat. Um, one is, are you seeing any impact of avian flu? We had real bad avian flu in North America uh, this past year. Yeah, well, fortunately, we have not had any kind of uh, effects yet of uh, avian flu in Costa Rica. And I'm crossing fingers not to. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, and then what is the truth and mythology about the harpy eagle? Well, harpy eagle was a resident in Costa Rica in the past. Um, it, was, it was declared extinct for a while, uh, or at least the scientific community put it on hold for a while. There have been recent records um, since the mid 1990s um, to the turn of the century in some of the areas that are very progressively becoming um, forested as I was showing you before. So those areas that are becoming healthier and thicker and larger in, in, in size area are those areas like uh, Corcovado in the Osa Peninsula or the Tortuguero National Park or the Talamancas. The Talamanca is such a vast area that has not been yet 
completely um, explored, if you will. So there might be presence of harpy eagles in the area, but we just don't know that because not very many people go in there. So there have been some reports with photograph, with photograph records of it in the places aforementioned. Right. And then, is there any bird species in Costa Rica you have not seen, Gustavo? Yes. Um, well, one of the things I forgot to mention is that um, there are a lot of, remember the little Coco Island that I was showing you before, very close to the Galapagos Archipelago? Well, I've been there birding, and I've seen the three endemic species there, but there are a lot of pelagic species, species of the open sea, that you very rarely get to see unless you get on a boat and go 300, 400 miles in the open sea, close to those pelagic islands to get to see some of the very unique species. I've not done that yet. So obviously I have not seen uh, those species. There are some species in the continent like harpy eagle, for example. I've never seen harpy eagle in Costa Rica. Um, I've seen crested eagle in Costa Rica, but I've never seen a harpy eagle in Costa Rica. And there are some very unique birds in Costa Rica that are not easy to see. They're not easy to find. They're only found in very um, hard to access corners of, of the country. And so those are the ones that, are, that, are, that I have not seen. Gustavo, thank you so much. Um, I would like to add that uh, Randy noted, I think he's, he's saying you are a little humble in your um, response to your plant knowledge, that you really do know your plants of Costa Rica. But uh, point well taken, the biodiversity is so intense there that no one person can come close to knowing it all. And thank you for being part of the the crew of people that are just so passionate and willing to share. Um, as as uh, Gustavo mentioned, there he does have a website. You can find lots of information there. And I, I've been down there once um, with you. And uh, I know a lot of people that have been down there once or more. And we all highly recommend it. Um, and even if you can't get to the, the field station, just time spent near tutelage is time well spent. And thank you so much for continuing to share that and thank for you, sharing Steve. with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody.